There it is. There it is. All nice. right. Hey, YouTube. We finally figured out how to go live with you. Those of you that have been waiting for the stream to start. Hey, we're, we're YouTube noobs and um, we're going to get it figured out, but we're grateful for the technology. We're grateful for the opportunity to connect with so many people. And uh, I'm grateful to be able to bring you into my living room. This is, um, this is the house that Jen and I have lived in for uh, the last decade. It's going on the market this week. It's coming week. So if you want to buy a house, just hit me up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, um, we did a whole introduction just a second ago, and then we realized it wasn't streaming on YouTube. So for those that are in the Zoom call that are coming out of the group coaching session we just had, you're going to get to hear it again. For those on YouTube, it'll be like it's brand new for you. So welcome again, like I said just before, and uh, welcome to my home. I've got with me my friend Scott Landers and, of course, Chris Burgess. You guys know him. Uh, but Scott may be new to you as well, and I want to give him a brief introduction, and then we're going to talk about some interesting things as they relate to current events. So I met Scott a little over um, a year ago. In fact, we're coming up on two years, I guess we have to say. And Scott is a very, very smart person, way smarter than me. And he's got a lot of interesting experiences in the market that I just don't have. Being, he consults with funds that have billions of dollars invested the people that are moving the market you know when we're talking about hey don't don't just jump into trades before the market decides which way it's going to go scott's clients are the ones that are deciding which way the market's going to go and they're constantly working together with him to protect their assets pun intended that was equally funny the first time i said it too as everybody's <laughs> laughing in zoom um and and they're they're constantly developing strategies to not just survive, but thrive during these experiences that like we're having right now. Like it or not, you know, even though the NASDAQ just hit bona fide bearish market status, the S&P is halfway there. There's fortunes that are being made currently and about to be made as we go forward. And so, Scott, I'm so grateful that you've carved out some time today to jump in here and talk to us a little bit about, you know, how what your experience is bridging that gap because i know you work with a lot of retail traders but you work with a lot of institutional pro traders as well so just from a thirty thousand foot overview as we kick things off and i'll i'll stop sharing my screen in case you want to share anything on your screen um you know talk to me a little bit about how the institutions are looking at these current events that we're in and what we as retail traders can learn from that thanks i'm glad to be here guys thank you for being here um Thanks, Josh, as always. Um, hang on one second. All right. So uh, this is reality of my life this morning. I got some information last night from a fund. We had a call this morning. It's about an hour long. They are, they do, they transact in billions. I mean, literally an annual basis, they're doing billions of dollars worth of deals. And they have a pension side. They have an equity side. So I'm dealing with the pension side this morning. And one of the things that's probably... Maybe obvious to everybody, but not so obvious. And I'm going to tie this in for everybody here in just a minute on how this impacts you as retail traders. It hasn't crossed my mind globally, at least not yet, because it's just not on the charts, I guess. I want you guys to think back to COVID the past couple of years. How much money do you think governments around the world, municipalities have spent, ventilators, PPP protection, all this? Okay. Now we have rising inflation. And people are getting squeezed at the pump, as you made the point earlier, Josh, of what you're paying for diesel up in Tennessee. There is a hard reality coming. Your municipalities are not going to raise taxes on you. They're going to need to raise them on them. They can't fund projects they need to get done that get funded. So you have funds right now who also see what's going on in the broader market, and it's raising all sorts of red flags. They see inflation. They see extreme moving crude oil. And if you look at most a lot of situations historically the market when we have rising rate inflation, but when you really have just rising crude oil prices, like we're seeing them right now, they are usually a precursor to a much bigger correction in the market, a more sustained correction in the market. So what they're doing in a lot of cases with larger players, we're not talking your day traders or these smaller funds guys, we're talking much more macro events, macro traders, macro investors is a better way to say that. They are looking to diversify their assets out of markets into hard assets. You've heard about Bill Gates buying up land. If you haven't, he's a mass buyer of mass amount of land in the United States of America. 
I'm seeing this fund literally looking right now at doing roughly $2 billion in deals that were discussed this morning coming forward in the next 90 days to 120 days. These deals take time to get done, worst case, six months if all goes to schedule. That's their reality because they don't see the value. Do not confuse that, that they might see certain opportunities in the market, but they're looking to divest into other hard assets that have nothing to do with the equity market right now. To give you the other side of that, then they have their equity side of the firm as well. They tend to, this particular one I'm talking about, tends to look at much more macro levels. So I'm showing you a chart of the S&P 500. So these green blocks on here, these boxes, I don't want you to stress over how they're created. Just recognize that that data is over a decade old. In other words, these boxes are projected literally out for the next 15, 20 years. And we just happen to hit them and then make support resistance. The Trader Traction Group has seen this from me. Facebook has seen it from me. People like that over the years where I post this stuff. So from a retail perspective, it doesn't mean you take your investments and you abandon the ship and you sell everything. The question I would pose to a lot of you, if you have investments, have you ever studied hedging? TSU has this great you know, encyclopedia of stuff on learning options, right? Have you learned how to hedge your portfolio is one thing back of your head. When the market's already down you know, 10, 20%, I'm always amazed People want to buy in the throes of despair when there are blood in the street. I'm going, you've missed it. Your options have expanded their volatility, and you're not necessarily getting the bang for your buck. Are we on the precipice, so to speak, of the world coming to an end? I don't think so. I think the market's just been way too much vertical for a long time. I've made that point for the past couple of years. It's trying to come back to reality. We're not quite there yet. But when I compare what we as active traders do versus a larger player in the market, they're divesting assets right now to get into much more tangible 10-year assets. If they're looking 10 years and beyond this particular group, it's because they don't foresee the market return over the next decade. You've heard us from Warren, you know, Warren Buffett and others. Clearly, they tend to agree with that kind of visibility. That doesn't mean there's not chances for you guys to trade. There clearly is. There's just a mindset of the buy and hold. People that chase hot money, if you will. Remember, I remember GameStop probably went just absolutely nuts, right? That was hot money. Solar stocks at one point was hot money. Now it's commodities. If I am a retail trader, position or in swing investor, I'm looking at the commodity sector. Well, Scott's just gone up. I understand that. But where there is a bear market, which is in tech, if you notice, you're seeing equal or greater proportion as techs coming in, there's the rotation of the commodities. So if you're trying to play the long side of the market or you can only play alongside, look at your commodities as what my other funds are doing and have been. I've got one, they manage roughly 2 billion and they've been in commodities before this move because they could see the turn with tech rotating and them coming in. To be clear, if you don't understand how these larger funds work, please realize they don't come in and drop $2 billion at one time into the trade. They're accumulating. And when they go into distribution, which you've seen quite a bit of lately, it's not all here, push the button, and we're done. They ebb and flow. Okay, And something Josh brought up um, earlier, talking about just looking at the way on one of the charts he was showing in the prior, prior class, if you don't know this guy's when markets are rising, you want to pay attention to the lows. When markets are dropping, you pay attention to the highs and lows. So for anybody who's black boxing or doing algorithms, you understand the way it goes down is not the same way it goes up. There is a difference. They care about the bid side on the way up. Okay, They care about the bottom of that chart. When it's coming down, they care about the top and the bottom. And most people miss that. I learned it from an old timer probably 20 years ago. And it finally clicked one day. I'm like, well, what does it matter? It matters greatly because if not, stocks will eventually go to zero. That's why when you guys, if you do wave counts, Elliott Wave or the different wave counts I teach, you're normally three to five waves up and three waves going down. If you get five, start looking to potentially reverse and go back long. So does that help, Josh? I know I just covered a yeah. lot really fast, but. Oh, you're, all, you're always a good source of fire hydrant when I, when I need one. Sorry. Um, so, you know, connect the dots for retail traders. I'm assuming a lot of people listening to this are, you know, stock traders only, you know, some may actually trade the futures market, but, you know, is there a way that 
that people who trade stocks and ETFs can participate in some of those commodity moves without getting into futures trading. Absolutely. Um, NRGU is one that you can play with. Um, I know it's moved up a whole lot lately. Oil holders, the OH, or if you type in oil holders and what makes it up, your Schlumberger's, uh, what is it, Apache, APC, names like that, Mosaic. I'm not a big fan of silver or gold or gold names. I have two clients that are in gold, actually three clients that are in gold. But I like gold more as a buy and hold scenario when I play that, not as a trading vehicle. I don't like the way it trades. The, the other sort of gold is and silver is basically just a, a hedge against inflation. Like, right. you know, you, you come out neutral. Inflation goes up, gold goes up, and you end up neutral. Exactly. Over the so long term. For those that are in retail, if you want to play on the long side, focus on those commodity names. The inverse of that would be, and this is one I've mentioned in Trader Traction. The thing that caught my attention, I'm going to shift to a chart real quick just to point this out, was Goldman Sachs. And I've had this conversation with some fund managers. If, and you guys all know, this is Goldman Sachs, this is 12 timeframes, but she's weak. But in a rising rate environment where the Fed is saying, we're going to hike rates, shouldn't Goldman going higher? Morgan, JPM, they should benefit. And now you bring in Russia, Ukraine, which makes everything so interesting right now, right? Dollars rising. You got a war going on that impacts the whole world. You got crude oil going through the roof. That is, in effect, a tax hike on civilization at large because things cost more and everything is tied to that movement of fuel, like product services. If the Fed was going to really raise rates, and this is why we always talk about, Josh tells you guys this, it's one thing to hear what they're saying. Now mm -hmm. go look at the price and see what it's doing. And the price isn't telling me they're going to raise rates. I, again, we don't really know, but in light of the current economic challenges, with where diesel, crude oil, gas futures moving 30 cents in a day and going limit up, it's just, it's hard as a retail trader. If that's the case, if they do, then you've got to start watching Goldman, Morgan, JPM. But if they don't, and the price action is telling you they're not doing that yet. Otherwise, it would be, right, they'd be anticipating it, and it doesn't look like they are. I'm not saying it won't get there. But those are the subtle things as retail traders you can look for when the Fed is doing their Fed speak. So it puts you in front of opportunities to capitalize on this. And this is, you know, I'm for the past couple of years, I've tried to get people to understand you need to watch the energy in the commodity sector. We could see this ever so slowly starting to turn. And the reason I bring this up is I watch traders and they'll say, retail traders, it's like, oh, I can't get it now. It's too high. And I'm like, okay, so just a little piece of information. Apple, we all know love Apple stock, right? So stock used to be at $100. It was actually like at 40 and then it went to 700. That is $600 worth. Okay, so what is there? A hundred pennies per dollar. There were 60,000, 60,000 new highs in that stock from 100 to 700, true? 60,000. And people mm -hmm. always had this mindset of it's just too high. And Chris brought about the RSI. You, we really should do a session one day on oscillators, RSIs, anything that's a momentum indicator. There's value if we can get retail traders not to feel sucked into that you need the signal, you want the signal, just like a flag pattern, like Bukowski's books, you want the pattern, but then you want price to confirm it. Mm -hmm. If it's news, right, Josh, we want the price to confirm it. Mm -hmm. Even, and you know, with Chris, you can chime in, please. We look at option trades, right? Does price and the movement and the options seem like they're acting toe and toe? Or is there a divergence and the smart money, which are the option players, the large ones, are not confirming the price action? And you'll see that reflected if you watch your charts. There's great day trades I've seen with price, like a true just price chart, like buying the shares, forgive me, and the options, the underlying options not reflecting. I'm like, and then you watch the stock come back down. And it's because of smart money that's hedging knew what was coming before we did. They're mm -hmm. leaving footprints, guys. You just have to learn and walk through it and josh and you do a great job of marking the charts and getting people to see this so i hope that one might helps. say genius job of marking charts no <laughs> um actually that i'm gonna diverge off from um you know that path a little bit here and chris has been playing around with some interesting things talking about the the market leaving footprints and 
you know, this world of unusual options is fascinating to me. Uh, it's one of the coolest things that I've started learning about here recently. And Chris is the one that introduced me to that. You want to comment on that at all, Chris, about the market leaving footprints and being able to kind of see what's happening in Wall Street and what their bets are? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm sure this isn't news to Scott, but um, it's something that I discovered. I've, you know, I came across it a few years ago, but I only recently like really started diving into it uh, last year. And uh, I've been sharing, Josh, what I've been getting into. And that's um, kind of like what you were saying with, you know, the, the big boys leaving footprints. And that's like literally what I've been looking at is basically just piggybacking on some of those big trades, right? Because um, as I'm sure you're familiar, right, there's no dark pools in the options market. So every options trade that happens is public knowledge. And that's not true of the, the stock market, right? There's a lot of not exactly public trades or the information's not public in a timely manner uh, in, in stocks. Assuming I'm getting that correct, you can definitely feel free to correct me at any point here. Um, and on the, on the options market, right, we can see when a big player goes in and takes, you know, a $20 million bet on an options trade where, you know, the average um, open interest across the options chain is, you know, maybe a couple hundred contracts. Someone comes in and buys 10,000 contracts in a day. Well, you know, that's, that's a big footprint that they're leaving, right? And that's just sort of what I've been working with lately and developing some strategies and putting guardrails around that, you know, because it's not like every, uh, every time you see that, you just go hog wild and copy what they did. But um, it does, it, it leaves clues that we can start to follow. And I'm sure you're, you're better at picking up on that sort of thing in the stock market. I'm not as versed on following that in the stocks, picking up the footprints from the stocks. But one of the things that you mentioned that also just to, Go off topic again. <laughs> One of the things that you mentioned um, was this this distribution, right? So as these big funds are divesting to get into other areas, right, other asset classes, divestiture necessarily means that they're going to be selling. Am I wrong? And you know, like you said, like I know that they're not just going to be dumping everything all at the same time on the same day, but when you have lots of gigantic funds dumping sizable amounts, even over a period of time. I mean, that has to put downward pressure on the market, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're battling that situation and that's, I try to, because one of the funds I deal with is a more active trading fund. The one thing you notice, and I've said this a lot, I've, Josh and I talked in the past, we think how I say this, I will see when I'm working at the particular fund I work with all the time, they're coming in short and I'm going, <laughs> a retail trader can't do that. They're trying not to advertise what they're doing. They're not like, hi, look at me. We're going to sell, right? And that's the thing like the options market. Like you said, there are things that's leaving footprints and clues. And it's easy to manipulate with the, all the different type of price bars. So to get more directly to answer, they are playing the game. There is a lot of misdirection. And even the hedge funds, I will watch them come in and going, there's no way I could ever teach this to a retail trader. They'll get slaughtered because it's still going higher, but you guys are shorting because they know where the top is. Like they know I will get, I get it all the time. I know exactly what level their zero points are when they're coming in. You're just, you're battling that stuff. And the other thing that I've come to learn because the hedge funds I did not know is they run different regimes. So I know like in currency markets or futures markets, we go to sleep here in the US and over in London, they've got their desk running. That desk's purpose is to take it, the, and this I'm just simplify this. The US market is gonna take it higher, London is gonna take it lower. Like when they swap over, it's like it, it, they run different regimes. So we have this opinion as retail that, wow, if I just, you know, if I could just hit the magic bullet, well, the thing is, you might need in the futures market or no, but let's just the currency market, you might need six different total regimes there. It's like six different meals when you sit down at Josh's house and he's cooking for all of us. Right. There's six different meals. Yeah. And that's what we're running into here. So we think we have this one holy grail indicator, but they might be running an, uh, a momentum strategy in one desk. They might be running a trend strategy in another desk. So, so you're this saying is there's a scenario where in the U.S. market, they, they suck in the momentum of retail traders to, to essentially harness their buying power 
that drives the value of the stock higher, you know, supply and demand. All the while, they know that when the European market opens up, they're getting ready to slaughter this thing overnight. Absolutely, hundred percent. I know because I've lived through it with a fund. I'm like, there's no way this has got high. That's launch. disconcerting. <laughs> this was one of the things I learned from some, you know, back back when I was a grasshopper and all of that. I mean, obviously, still learning every day. But back uh, back in the day, one of the things I learned from some professional traders on Wall Street, they were saying like the pro money needs dumb money to exist, right? Like pro traders need the retail traders because you retail traders provide the liquidity for the Thank pro you. traders to take the positions against you, basically. They help with liquidity. They help with price discovery. So when you hear, at least in the U.S. or people outside the U.S., they want to ban day traders or stock traders, I'm going, and then you have your pros like, oh, Congress, no, ma'am, no, sir, you're not doing that. We need them. Because if not, it's Goliath trading It's Goliath. You don't want that. Y you don't. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't click. It doesn't make sense to have that scenario. And I don't know why we would do it, but it's because, well, you know, we need to protect you, the little people, if you will. It's going to say, and I'm going, yes, and Wall Street will not exist without that. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But yes, those games are getting played. And I know with one funds I work with, they have called zero point turns. They know literally what bar, what time to start initiating their shorts against. And I mean, I'll have text before the day's over with coming from them or private DMs that we deal in. And I'm just looking at it and they just ripped 40 points out of ES. And I'm just like, and it it's like watching it just stop. This is this brings up two points though. Josh, you mentioned you were looking at charts earlier about the non EMA. Nine is the most stable number universe. Huh. So if you're going to use a moving average and you wanted nine EMSMA or anything related to nine, nine, ninety-nine hundred, nine thousand, yes, we will leave that because it's a lot more advanced topic, but don't ignore nine. Um, so there's Noted. that in the back. Yeah, it's it's if you're gonna look at something like that, definitely. And the other thought just lost my head, it'll come back to me. Well, you, well, your thoughts coming back to you. I want to interject this here because you know, I'm I'm just listening to guys talk and thinking if I was a retail trader, it could be easy to be very discouraged right now. And um, I want to clarify, it's the uneducated retail trader that gets led to the slaughter. Um, when you're, when you understand how the game is played, there's an opera. It's, I tell students in my classes all the time. Um, I think you do too as well, Scott, like just be humble. I'm not looking to be prideful and be the guy who's wearing the, the suit with the long coattails. I just want to ride on that guy's coattails. And that's why I tell our students all the time, you're not going to move the market. You need to let the market decide which way it's going to go and then participate in that move and learn to spot the head fakes. Because once you know what to look for, they're obvious, right? You can know the strategy. You just have to be willing to play their game. You're not playing your game. You're playing their game. Yep. I got it. I got a dovetail here. So the thing I've used for the past two decades of working with traders, I always, I like, I, and for those who've heard it, indulge if people haven't, I love to body surf, but you will never find me guys on a surfboard. Six foot seven, lanky is going to get hurt bad on a surfboard, but I love to body surf as a little <laughs> kid and I still love it now when I go to the beach. I'm six foot seven. So clearly on a decent day, I can see off on the horizon. I can see the waves and I can time them, right? I cannot stop that wave. I'm six foot seven, 180 pounds. There's not much here. I'm not going to stop the wave. Have that same mentality. I want to look at the wave, time the wave and hop on the wave and let it bring me in. Sometimes it dumps me right on my head. Other times a small wave brings me all the way to the shoreline because it's just got that energy to it. If you, for those of you who love surfing, you get this analogy ride the market wave it is a wave it is a wave of energy the difference is we have people much bigger than us who are pushing that wave sometimes we get tsunamis we get black swans we're in a black swan event right now for the market from this war but you're spot on you've and from retail and i just had this conversation in traction those some of the traction are in here right now what it needs to go through your head with this is you retail has advantages that my hedge fund guys I work with do, do not. They're coming in at levels where they need bigger swings. They have much larger position. You guys come in 100 or 10,000 shares and they will not even notice you. Unless you're doing 100 contracts or more, I listen to somebody I know that deals in the options market heavily. He is a, actually a market maker. He says, and he said, 100 contracts or less, 
at least their firm, the market maker they did, he said, we're not studying you. It's not that we don't know you're there or the system doesn't know you're there, but after 100 plus, we're paying attention to you. Most of you, if you trade 100 contracts or just below there and you do this right, you become a ninja as I talk about it. Guys, you guys have advantages they don't. In fact, sometimes they hate retail because you have the ability to come in out where they don't. And I'm not talking about flash trading hedge funds. I'm talking about bigger players. If you'll just wait for it to come to you, and I'm showing you Riven because it's been documented out with the shadows and all that we do in the, in the, the course or the class. But I just highlighted this one yesterday. Well, the stock's entry was at $45.05, and we're seeing roughly at $39. And that's since yesterday, by the way. But there's a pattern to this, and I'm letting that energy suck that thing down and pull on it. We've done it with Facebook at over, what is it, 120 points now or something like that since its earnings hit. And I don't mean because of, I'm talking after earnings. So if you think you can't do this as retail, I would much rather retail than pro. I will never run a fund. I gave, I've been asked, I've been offered, I said, I don't want that nightmare. There's too much to manage. Retail has the best of all worlds. You can make your own hours. You can have your own systems. You can trade when you want to trade. And you don't have to be the biggest and still mm -hmm. make a great living, guys. So you have advantages. It's quite the opposite. People see the, the Hollywood aspect of how great it is. It's really not. Their fees, I've got one that spends hundred no, $200. 200k a month just in fees data co-location i mean and that's nothing for some of them it's not it's not cheap to play at that level either guys embrace what josh is telling y'all rel you know be glad enjoy this we have the best of all worlds doing as retail i'm telling you i love working with the people and helping you guys but i get to see where retail struggles and what the pros know. And I get to see the best of both worlds. I'm that fulcrum point and I see best of both worlds. And that gives me insight that I can help you guys with. Gives me insight to come with. It's, it's just fascinating. Anyway. This is a good time for me to bring up, um, you know, for those of you guys that are interested in learning what some of these strategies are, Scott's doing a master class on Tuesday. It's free. There's no charge. I'm going to put this link in YouTube, I think. And I'm going to put it for our friends that are here in Zoom with the group coaching. There's the link for you guys there as well. Um, and we'll also put it in the comment section in YouTube. And um, I asked Scott to come and give a, give a talk on one of the ways that institutions are, are looking at these moves and spotting opportunities. And so the key here is you need to understand what they're looking at so that you can participate in the upside potential, whichever direction it is they're trading, up or down. Um, the other thing I wanted to say as well, I think as retail traders, we feel like we are unseen by the institutions. And I don't want to riff on the whole, like the market makers running my stops. That, I mean, maybe it happens, but it, it doesn't happen. Like just, you just had a bad stop. <laughs> like, let's be honest. And if you trade the way that we teach you, they can't even see your stop because it's a contingency order. Um, but I promise you, I know for a fact that we have institutional traders that are taking training at TradeSmart University. They are learning the same technical analysis you are. Not that they don't know the technical analysis, but they want to know what's new out there. They I promise you, they know um, unusual options activity like Chris was talking about. And so they're using that information to their benefit. So therefore... When is now the right time to bring in a guy like Scott and use their strategies against them to your benefit? So sign up. It's Tuesday night, 8 p.m. There's recording if you can't be there live. Uh, again, no charge. I just really want you guys to get this figured out. So Man. come check that out. I wanted to chime in real quick too, just on what Scott was saying before. I think it's really easy as a retail trader to, you know, when someone starts talking about what pros are doing on Wall Street and all of that, I think it's easy to kind of get into a bit of a, like a defeatist mindset like, oh, you know, there's no way we can possibly win against that. But, um, you know, you kind of have to realize what your advantages are. And I think Josh, you're the one that uses this analogy of like, you know, imagine two ships out at sea, right? Like you've got like a gigantic, you know, tanker or something like that that thing takes a very long time to move, right? Versus a retail trader is like a little skiff, right? Like you can easily pivot and change mm -hmm. on a dime. So there's a lot of advantages that retail traders have, even if it may not seem like it. Um, so, you know, don't get discouraged. <laughs> there's there's plenty of stuff yeah. you can do that big traders cannot. 
it's we do have the best of all worlds. He's you know, Chris is spot on with this. You really do have the best of all worlds and you're not working for someone else. I just I want to add to this really quick. My son's in college first year. He's majoring, maybe double major. He's still deciding he's got Tom, but he's definitely do finance. And they have what's called, they have a fund. There's about 30 of minutes, like a club. They meet on Monday evenings and they only do fundamentals. So I want to just pull my hair out because there's <laughs> no charge and no technicals. I'm like, what are you doing? But let me give you guys context of what happens with major funds. Now, this thing's small. It's an incubator. They started half a million up to like 740K now in the past three years. Okay, so they're doing something right. But let me share some context for you. They get together. They have nine different sectors. And this is not just us, guys. This is what Chris has just alluded to here. This particular fund, which is nothing in size, I get it, but it's representative of what a Goldman, JP, or Morgan's doing at the same point, Tom. In fact, these are people that are helping guide a lot of what they're doing with their CIO. They have to be good fiduciaries. They have to have risk controls in the portfolio. So they come in as their group. They present to the rest of the group and say, we want to put you know, $5,000 in this position or $15,000, where it's going to be. Do you know when they'll actually buy the stock? Not for another 90 days. So everybody thinks everybody's always constantly doing something. They're making plans for longer term plays. And so everybody thinks everybody's watching the charts. They're not. There's a strictly mathematical modeling, and that's mm -hmm. it. And then I'm going, you want to buy Facebook right now? Um, and it, but they're, they have a whole time of like a year or longer. And I know from dealing with certain funds, they have mandates that they cannot hold a position that they buy it. The expectation is they'll have it for 10 years. It's not short term. And that's the whale who's underneath it. But what everybody thinks is that they're all the same place turning and twisting. They're not. It, and again, the little skiff, little speedboat versus the giant Princess Cruise liner, it takes time to turn that sucker. But a go-kart or a golf cart, shoom, it, that's the whole point. And I'll add one more thing. We just talked about some traction this week. If you struggle with the vertigo of trading a smaller time frame, step back as a retail trader. Go to a 60. You got one whole hour for your bar to complete. A whole hour. Do you know how many miles you could run an hour, run some errands, do whatever, vacuum the house, whatever? It's like, and still your chart hasn't even entered yet. It, you don't have to be a, quote, active, fast day trader to have lots of success is my point. And I, I, when I bring these things up, I'm trying to be respectful of time and how much I'm talking, but because I want you guys to understand, you can make trading be whatever you want it to be, period. It doesn't need to be this complex thing. And the more complicated you guys make it, analysis paralysis, less efficiency, and you're less likely to trade. I guarantee you, Chris, you have your system down in your head, and you're probably pretty bare bones simple. I've not stayed with what Chris does, but most people, when you see their success, have a process grandma's recipe there's five ingredients 315 in the oven for 15 minutes that's how your trading should be otherwise you'll get locked into the rabbit hole and you'll never get out of it and you'll you won't get there i mean chris i'd love to hear your experience from your standpoint with that as well yeah um i think definitely as uh more of a, a newer trader it was always the um i don't like a magnetic pull, I guess, kind of to try to overcomplicate everything, right? Like always yep. try to add 97 different indicators to your charts and, you know, make sure you know everything about the Nine's the perfect and number. <laughs> 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 and yeah, I, I have found over time that like the simpler I make things, it just makes making decisions so much easier yes. too, right? Like yes. if you look at 97 different indicators, you're going to find some that go against whatever your analysis is, right? Like you'll find something contrary if you look enough. So I have found that oftentimes that is less helpful than it is more helpful to keep adding more and more stuff. So over time, I eventually just got to the point where I was stripping down stuff. And now, you know, we're down to a, a pretty, yeah, like you said, like bare bones, essentially, especially compared to what I was doing. I uh, call bare bones them. approach to it. And I'm sure Josh is the same way. And I've noticed too, like the, you know, more professional traders tend to have less, 
like stuff on their charts all at the same time, right? Usually, I, I shared a meme about this in the Slack channel, but new traders usually just have, you know, their charts are just cluttered everywhere with every indicator that they've ever learned and, you know, all of the lines at every candle and it just gets a mess. And then, you know, how can you tell what you're looking at? I know that, um, Raymond, I think you're in here and Raymond's in the traction group and all that. And Raymond's a season like we are. And I know that he has his three rules where he takes a trade and he knows he violates one of them, right? There's a, there's trouble coming. When I do trader turnarounds, like individual private one-on-ones, the ones I turn around, you just nailed it, Chris. They'll have all the stuff on their chart. I'm going, how's that working for you? Like, I know what's coming out of my mouth next. I'm like, we're about to strip your charts naked. I call it naked charting. And immediately when this happens, there's this, mm, I don't want to, mm, I'm like, what can't you live without? Better yet, it, better yet, what's on your chart that you absolutely understand? What does this mean to you? I don't know. It's just on there. Josh said, put a non email on there and play Josh. All of a sudden, you got all the stuff on your chart. And you're, you're just like, okay, what do I do now? When I teach traction, well, when I turn people around, I'm like, okay. So I have a trader turn around over a decade ago. I will still let this person trade my money today. It has, I think, three things on the chart. His performance went up. His returns went up. His system quality index numbers went up. Everything from the roof. And I'm like, dude, you could run your own fund. And he actually is considering doing it one day, but he has a track record to go with it. Before that, there was like 17 things. I said, okay, now what you think about all 17 things on your chart, we have to put in context and what they mean to you. And your brain gets to three and it says, your birthday's in three sections, your phone number, your social security number. Think of all things in your world, they're in threes. One, two, three, your, your brain's like, I can't do anymore. And so with traction, I have one indicator we use for the um, swing pivot concept. I've put color to it, but then I put 12 time frames. It's like people can't do it. I'm like, but it's the same concept repeated. You're just looking at different fractals. So we see, well, just to give you context, right? Where'd you go? Right there. There's 12 time frames. It's the same information repeated, but it's based off different fractals. My hedge fund has 16 time frames of this done because they have tick data that are running on the right hand side of the screen. But this way, I know my day traders, where my swing traders, my position traders, and my investors, my whales are all broken down. I have my dashboard in front of me and I know exactly what it means. It's the reason I know that we keep shorting Facebook because the chart tells me to keep shorting Facebook, not because of my opinion, because the chart's breaking it down that way. And it doesn't matter if I'm doing geometrics or whatever. You guys as retail have it the best. You may not know it, but you have it the best, but you've got to get back to the minimum. Amount. These charts are created off of literally four total data points literally it's actually two points just looking back and it's all it, literally that's what created all this color code is from that that's how simple it is when we do you know when i showed you the chart of ribbon a few minutes ago that ribbon chart is literally shadows is based off of two points but we can extract information there's no volume on that but if i were to show you guys for example sentiment and get i get it guys i have a lot of data but i do a lot of development work for fun so i have to have all the stuff but I know with this right here on, say, sentiment, I know what these meanings are. I know what that information is telling me and how to ascertain that. But it has volume. That's price, time, volume, and news flow. But I don't have a lot of volume stuff. And yet I got a hedge fund that trades and never uses volume. And they did 6% total return last week on their portfolio. Total portfolio 6% in one week. Not, I mean, think about that kind of money they're pulling out. But it's... It's just the nature of it. So, 1% a day, 12X is your account in a year. I'm just saying. Goals. This is the kind of level that they, and they can't afford not to get it right because they are fiduciaries of other people's money. So it's a serious game for them. And plus they want to make big money, but that's, I mean, we all do. I get it. But I'm just trying to give you guys some context around this, but the rules is Chris is bringing up, the less information on your chart. And if it is detailed, then try to group it. So let's just say Josh gives you nine indicators. Then group that into three sections. You got three moving averages, four, nine, 18. Then look at it as one unit. Bring that three into one. 
it, it will simplify your life. But if you'll strip it down, what I call naked charting, less is more. And you don't need 16 oscillators and 16 trend indicators. You need a trend indicator that understands trend, you know, oscill oscillator, you want to use volume, use volume. And then price is your ultimate arbiter. Price is what was paid. Price is what's paid on your option chain. That's the, the you guys will go always back to your core basics. Where we play football, guys, on a football field, you trade on an X, Y axis. That's why I cheat the geo or the geometry because it represents. Josh has seen those charts, and it, I know it drives people nuts, but simplify it's my point. All right, Scott, we got just a few minutes left here. I want to do a hard pivot. You listen to the news, and it seems like we're on the brink of World War III. Humanitarian crisis is tragic, and I don't, I don't make light of it. Um, I also look at the stock market. You hinted at this earlier, but we, we went in a different direction, so you know we ran that way. And but you look at the stock charts, and it, I don't get the impression that Wall Street is forecasting World War III. You know, what are you hearing from your clients? Are they concerned this is the end of the you know, world as we knew it? And um, I guess let's start there. And I have one more follow-up question, so don't, don't take 20 minutes on that one. Yes, sir. Um, no, they don't see it as the world's coming to an end yet. They really don't. Uh, the term earnings recession has been put out there by a lot of people I know in the industry, and they feel like we are in an earnings recession. And it'd be hard not to think that. The question is how protracted is it going to be? And a lot of that hinges on what's happening with the Fed, with what's happening to inflation right now, and how quickly they get their hold on it, right? That's the baseline of their thinking. And then how much of the catalyst of Ukraine, Russia, and the outlier for this is where we pivot really fast. The one thing that would keep me up at night if I'm running a billion dollar fund or whatever it's going to be for somebody is if China decides it's time to take on the world. Seriously, and I, and I don't like even talking about it, but if China says it's time to start rhetoric with their body, that one concerns me because that will literally, you just pull the rug on your body. At that point, I'm short. Like if it becomes really clear, I can't say it's Taiwan, but I can say it's one of these things. Guys, we weren't in World War II until what happened. Pearl Harbor was bombed, right? We stayed out of it and Japan came after us, right? That's the bottom line. You never know what's going to drag us into this. And I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but we are in a black swan moment, if you will. But that's kind of a nutshell. It's they're more concerned right now. They know that Russia Ukraine will get resolved. It's a massive headline that Goldman Sachs pulled out of Russia. That was not easily decided, guys. That tells you that they are walking away. And that that's not something they did lightly, guys. That's not to placate anybody. That's but I'm only going back to this because it is more of um it's not a cause, it's a symptom, so to speak. It's part of it, but it's not the driving factor. They're more worried about what their models are for forecasting for this year and into 23 for the S&P. And right now their models are saying we're pricing too high and we need to come in a little bit until we get some more clarity. Remember, shoot first, ask questions later, right? It's the market wants to sell and then figure it out. It's also a very efficient discounting mechanism. I hope that helps. Yeah, um, it does help. And, you know, it was, it's interesting to me just to go current events for real fast and then back. Um, it's interesting to me the role that private companies are playing in this current proxy war that's happening, you know, with Pepsi's pulled out, Visa MasterCard pulled out, Amex pulled out, Goldman oh. Sachs pulled out. And I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know that I can conceive that. Like, can you all imagine your visa card doesn't work? Like, I don't know. And the ruble's been just plummeting. Their economy is trash. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how, how all that plays out. But my last question for you, Scott, and um, we're at the 45-minute mark now, so this is all bonus, bonus content, bonus time with Scott Landers. Um, you know, you started trading really young because you're a child prodigy and a genius and just a great human being at that. And so you remember, you know, a similar economic experience in the late 70s, 80s, you know, when mortgage rates were 15%, the, the uh, inflation rate was growing, you know, 7%. Um, and, you know, what, what do you remember from that? And But the more important question that I'd love to get to is like, what, 
What did you learn from that? What would you do the same? What would you do differently in 2022? For me, I'll, I'll share something really quick with this. I remember as a kid, my dad saying we get, we're paying, there was 21% interest you could get paid on an investment, 21%. And that, I mean, you probably see my eyes, like still, like I can see my dad's expression sitting in his, his, his chair's recliner. And I've only seen my dad anxious or nervous probably twice in my life. My dad's almost 95, for those that don't know. And that was a real surreal moment because this is when cold wars just seem just like it just won't go away and all that. And I mean, I'm born in 69, guys, if you contact, so I'm 52. So I remember 87 crashed like it was yesterday. I've been doing this since I was 13 years old. So I've seen a lot. I've learned a lot. And made God knows my mistakes. I didn't realize after the first shots are fired, the market rallies. The market's anticipating it. And so what would I do different now is I would try to understand and be a student of history. The reason when you see Paul Tudor Jones, if you don't know, he's his top 10 trader in history. If you know Paul Tudor Jones, anything about him, he's brilliant, like truly brilliant, Warren Buffett brilliant. And I bring this up because he's a student in the market. What does that mean, Scott? It means we looked at what happened at wars when we're in war. What happened when we're in a pandemic? You go back to your encyclopedia or your microfish or your Google now. Microfish. You, you microfish, right? You go to your local library and see if you can find the I old bet Chris paper. Burgess doesn't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah. you, so you look at history and you go look at the markets. And if your data... Like trade station listening to 113 years back, there are books, chart books, old data you can find. What did the market do similar during pandemics? What did it do during, and you try to understand it. And you understand if you're in an inflationary environment, you need hard assets. You'll hear cash is trash, right? So you've got to play the sectors that are benefiting. What, Scott, what if it doesn't last for five years? What retail wants, including retail investors, they want to know if they buy XYZ Corp A that for the next five years, they can hold it. it. When that cycle is done, it's done. When you go to a movie, it might be 90 minutes long. Or I think the new Batman movie is like two and a half or three hours or something like that. If one movie's 90 minutes and it's three hours, you've got to schedule for that. We can't control how long the cycle lasts. But if it's lasting, you've got to pay attention to it. I'll just give you one more thing to go here with the geometry. Just this is worth showing to answer this. Traction groups seen this. All three traction groups have seen this chart. This is a 40-year chart of the oil holders. This is a 40-year projection chart of the oil holders. It's, it's, it, it really is one of my favorite charts I have, like in history ever. Because there's so much value. We're not here to go through all this. But that chart's good for at least another 20 to 30 years. No exaggeration. That's the value of the chart, the way it's plotted. That's at least a 20 to 30-year chart. That, if I'm doing a major fund, is a big deal. And my expectations from that. But if I want to go back and look at what happened in history, and I go back to 07, 09 over here in the upper left corner up here, that tells me a lot of what happened when we got done. Most recessions are predated with a commodity inflationary run. The difference is it should be there in Goldman Sachs and those types of stocks should be going with it. And they're not. And the dollar, commodity should be strong, dollar should be weak. And I'm talking more macro. Well, if you don't know this, guys, the Dixie, just to give you context, and I'm going to add one thing to this and I'll be quiet. The Dixie is broken out. It's an updraft. We'll cover this Tuesday night, I think. That's an updraft on that daily, on that weekly. That's momentum. If you know the textbook, and I would just refer by this, if you know who John Murphy is, he's the biggest influence in my childhood um, and reason, one reason I love the market so much. He was the chief technical officer at CNBC. He no longer is because he needed five minutes to explain something, not a 30-second blip. Go pick up his book. It's on intermarket relationships. You will learn so much. And this goes back to Josh's question, Scott, what would you do differently? I would have understood better his book when it came out. I don't know when, when it was in my youth and capitalize more on that and see the 40,000 foot view. I would also recommend Ray Dalio talking about his book. And I forget which one it is right now. He's got several but it's looking at like at the past, I don't know, 5,000 years of mankind's history and what you should expect as things do change. And he sees China becoming the world superpower. 
taking over the U.S. Every 2,000 years in history is a major shift. I knew that one was in high school, not because of Ray Dalio. I bring this up because you can get into macro themes. You're like, well, Scott, I'm a day trader. Okay. Well, if I know that the major players are going to be long commodities, then as a day trader, I come in and I continue to buy long those stocks or I day trade in those directions or I swing trade them or I go short. It depends. Are they accumulation or distribution? And there's models that do this out there. If you guys will take the time just to do a little research, I will help you. Josh will help you. Chris will help you. But if you really want to understand the markets and be a student of it, if you just want to trade and make money, then let's just set your charts up and go. But if I am a student of the markets, both technically and when I try to see the whole picture, and it is answering Josh's question is, what would you do differently? I would understand more macro what's going on in the world around you and get out of that little bubble to see the bigger picture and see the bigger sector moves and then go capitalize on that. Mm-hmm. Period. That that's my simple answer. That's a long way of saying it, but I'm trying to give you guys context on what that is. That's good. That's yeah, really that, good. Yeah, uh, <laughs> one of the things I've I've said before to people is that like being a short term trader is not an excuse to not know what's going on in the world around you, right? Like Bingo. you have to know what's going on so you know what to trade, right? Like you can choose to trade whatever timeline you want, but you have to know what's going on in the market. So whether that's fundamentals or macro or whatever, like. You got to know what's going on. With, with that said, you know, we talked about this in, in the traction group. I'm watching RSX. I have people who wish they would have shorted this. This is the Russian index. But the thing is, if there is a big ceasefire, they shake hands, sing around a campfire, whatever moment, this thing is going to pop. But I'm not buying it based off that. I don't think it's not a business tomorrow. Like just, they don't let you trade anymore. I don't have any feeling that, but I do watch it because if that's going to happen, there's a good chance Wall Street's going to know it. And I'm talking the people in the know that move the markets will know it before we do. It's just the nature of the world we live in. They do channel checking. They do research. And that thing will be going a whole lot. It will be set to poise to go higher. You'll see a little, little wink at you in the chart somewhere. And it'll be up. I'm not advocating buy, sell, hold on RSX. I'm just trying to tell you when I'm looking more macro, because if if that shift happens, now the markets can finish their modeling and saying we're discounting for this efficiently. And now, well, McDonald's comes back, Goldman, whatever. I'm hypothesizing on this, but it's to help you understand there's always a bull market and a bear market simultaneously going on. And if we were, if in this, Josh, you asked a minute ago, if we are the world's coming to an end, then why are commodities going higher? Because if you go back and look at the pandemic, everything got sold. When we truly are, and you're like, well, Scott, you said there's a bull market. Yeah, it might be just gold as your only asset, and everything else is getting just destroyed. When real panic sets in, they throw the baby out the bathwater, guys. Go look at your charts. Don't take my word for it. Do your research and go look. He's like, holy cow, he's right. Or they play your staples, and your staples don't fall as much. That's what we talk about relative strength, relative weakness. The other day, Apple was not as weak as the NASDAQ. Well, that's relative strength. My, the, my son, their fund that they work with, they're being the market year to date by like one and a half percent. That doesn't mean they're up one and a half. They're not just down as much. And that's a sign of relative strength. On a really red day, you find a green stock in tech and the whole NASDAQ's red and your tech stock's green. That's not just random luck. That is somebody institutionally saying, we know something you don't. You need to pay attention to me. But you can see that by just a little bit of homework, guys. Does that help? I know we've covered a ton in a very small <laughs> amount of time, but does it help, I hope? It helps amazingly. Um, I was chatting with Chris before the show, just, you know, what we're going to talk about. And, you know, we just filling up the, um, the time that we have together. And I was like, I promise you, Scott will not be be low on, on content. So and you, you never fail to deliver. I do want to put a, a fork in this. We're coming up on an hour. And for those that are interested, we've got the masterclass coming up. That link is in the chat pane in the YouTube channel. And it's in the um, chat pane in the Zoom room here. Uh, we'll also put it in the comment section. Scott's also going to be doing a special Power Trader live uh, live event in Zoom. So anybody can come to that. Heck, we may even broadcast that on YouTube as well. I don't, I mean, why not? That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, and specifically looking at the market through these current event 
lenses and expanding upon several of these open loops that we created and didn't necessarily close today, such as looking at commodities, such as being aware of the world around you um, and whatnot. So come, for those that are unfamiliar with Power Trader, this is where uh, either myself or Chris Burgess or Scott or Steven, whoever's leading that week, uh, we're setting up our trades or our plan for the week ahead. And well, unlike the funds, we don't wait 90 days to place our trades. We do have a game plan going into the week. And that's what Power Trader is. And you're going to get to look over Scott's shoulder live and ask questions while he's doing that. So thank you, Scott, for your time today. Thank you for your generosity with the upcoming masterclass and you and um, Power Trader and all that. You know, I know we couldn't afford you if we had to pay your hourly rate. And so thank you for the generosity that you have. Thank you guys for participating this week. We had, I think, 30 watchers on YouTube, which is kind of exciting, up from six last week. And, uh, you know, at that rate, we'll be at millions here in the next few weeks. And I'm excited for when that happens. <laughs> Blessings on each and every one of you. I hope you go out and make fat stacks of cash and put that in your genes. I believe that when good people have more money, they're able to do even more good things in this world. So I'll let Chris and Scott sign off on their own. But for me, guys, blessings. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Appreciate y'all. Take care, everyone. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh.